everyone. Uh, amazing. What an incredible day it has been. I can't believe that we are here at the last session of the day. I was just in a session on folk music in the other room and, uh, and now we get to have some fun. We've had a lot of heavy, heavy topics and now we get to talk football. And uh, I see there's 15 folks out there uh, who want to learn about UP football. And I just want to remind folks that if they love this or if they want to let people know, uh, we are recording this and we will have it available for people to watch uh, starting next week sometime, we hope. And uh, so you will be able to share it from the same link uh, that you had. Um, and so we are going to have two presentations. Uh, first is going to be Dwight Brady and then myself. Dwight is going to be talking about the Packers uh, in the UP, and he'll tell you all more about that. I'm going to be talking about uh, legendary UP football, high school football teams. Um, but first, I want to start with Dwight. Uh, Dwight Brady is an Emmy Award winning filmmaker who has produced numerous documentaries ranging from Grey Wolves to Green Energy. Uh, this is his first historically driven documentary uh, that he has produced on the, the Green Bay Packers uh, and their connections with the legends of the UP. And he, but he is a professor here at NMU in the Department of Communication and Media Studies and has done some amazing work uh, with students and, and creating different projects. And, uh, but he is a, like me, a football fan at heart. And uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dwight. All right, well, thank you, Dan, so much. And uh, again, uh, it's an honor to be able to present today and uh, share some of my research with you and hopefully uh, everyone will find it of, of at least uh, some value here. So let me get set up and we'll we'll get ready to share screen and, and uh, fire up to the presentation here. I also want to uh, thank my colleagues here at uh, NMU and along with the, uh, the administration for providing me with a sabbatical uh, last year to have a leave of absence to uh, conduct the research and uh, produce this uh, television documentary called Linked to Legends, the UP teams uh, that played the Packers. And I, I think I owe also a, a big word of thanks to my wife who put up with me uh, just spending a lot of time in the guest room uh, and leaving her to do a, a lot of the, the homework with the kids over the last uh, several weeks and, and, and months. Uh, so a big thanks to her as well to giving me the time to uh, really hunker down and, and, and get this done. Uh, it it uh, turned out to be a, an hour and 10 minute documentary that uh, looks at the, the UP town teams that played the Packers and uh, other NFL teams between 1919 and uh, 1926. And uh, as I mentioned, a lot of work went into this. I mean, hundreds of hours of, of shooting, writing and editing, and then hundreds of phone calls, hundreds of emails and, and uh, it, it, again, it, it, uh, hundreds of newspaper articles, thanks uh, newspapers.com. I mean, that, that was uh, really helpful to be able to pull some of that in from, especially some of the uh, West End uh, UP papers uh, as well. Um, so with all that, I'm happy to present the 100 year old history of uh, Upper Michigan's uh, linked, uh, linked to uh, legends here. And even though I had a sabbatical to, to work on this project, um, I must confess that the, the, uh, the idea has been rolling around in my head since I was eight years old. Uh, mm -hmm. There I am. Uh, and what happened was my, my dad knew I was a big Packer fan and, and uh, he brought home a, a Packer preseason booklet one fall. And it had, of course, all the pictures of the players and a little biographical and statistical information about each player. And at the very end though, because I read this thing cover to cover, and at the very end, it had the schedule of every single game you know, the Packers had, had ever played or every season. And it had the, the team and the score um, of each game. And I noticed some of the teams that the Packers had played were towns from the UP that even at eight years old, I recognized. I mean, I, I'd heard of Ishpeming and I'd been to Menominee. Uh, so it was really quite a discovery for an eight-year-old kid from the UP to realize that his uh, green and gold heroes uh, had actually played some of the teams from the UP. And because at that time, I my only reference for the Packers was, you know, that they played teams in, in from Detroit, Chicago, Dallas, and, and, and uh, big cities like New York. So it... Uh, really it's kind of stuck with me all these years. And as we got closer to the 100 year uh, anniversary, 
of a lot of these interactions uh, with uh, the UP teams and the Packers, it seemed like the, the perfect time to uh, you know, take that deep dive into the subject matter and go beyond what I knew just from reading that little Packer booklet many years ago. And I think maybe the, the best way to uh, they talk uh, introduce you to this subject matter is just to give you the 30,000 foot view with uh, a video here that uh, uh, is basically the trailer for the documentary. Let me back up here and then we'll hit it. They toiled in Upper Peninsula mines and mills, but on weekends, the muscles forged by the sweat of their labor would be on display against some of the NFL's finest football teams. These guys did some dang dangerous stuff for, for an occupation. And, and we, we kind of speculate that football is kind of like maybe a game of croquet or something <laughs> after that. This rich deposit of UP football history is being unearthed in a new documentary revealing the links between the Upper Peninsula and the Green Bay Packers. His nickname was Tuffy and he ended up coaching the darn Packers you will learn about the scandal. And so after that happened, the Packers got kicked out of the league. The triumph and the tragedy. He popped up and shot them both. Don't miss Linked to Legends, the UP teams that played the Packers. So when I think about the documentary now, kind of standing back a little bit from it, um, you know, there are a number of themes that, that have kind of emerged. And, and one of them is that you know, the documentary is really a, a story about firsts. Um, the first team the Packers ever played was from the UP and their first road game, or, or in this case, a train game, because they, they rode the train up from, from Green Bay to play uh, the Iron, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Ishpeming Nagani All-Stars uh, here in, in Marquette County. And uh, so in their first Thanksgiving Day game that we're gonna get into in just a little bit, uh, again, was, was played against a, a team from, from the UP. Uh, and at the end of the day, though, it's just a story kind of about football, about one third is, is football, one third is history. And the other third is, uh, again, these themes and also the, just the human experience of people at that time. So uh, I, I tried to make this documentary appealing to, to folks, whether they really were uh, hardcore football fans uh, or not. So another theme that kind of emerges here is uh, it's a story kind of about perseverance, because when you think of the Packer organization itself, uh, you know, they should have gone by the wayside, just like the Canton Bulldogs, the Dayton Triangles, the Hammond Pros, the Milwaukee Badgers, all those teams from the early NFL that just didn't make it as, as town teams. Uh, but somehow the Packers were able to hang on and, and uh, you know, maintain that franchise uh, to, the, to the present day. And, uh, and also I think about the people of that era and the perseverance they had to, to show because um, sometimes things didn't always go as planned and there, there were, there were things that they had to overcome. Sometimes they, they were returning from World War I and going on to play pro football. And uh, they also had to work though other jobs. They couldn't make a living playing football. So in some of the jobs they worked here in the UP especially were, were quite uh, physically taxing and, and quite dangerous. So uh, in some cases, you know, people were hurt and sometimes even, even killed. So there, there's that aspect of it. And, uh, and looking at this player over here, this is a, a fellow by the name of Rigney Dwyer. Uh, this is a picture of him uh, as a high school player uh, for uh, Green Bay West. Uh, and he was, was actually born in the UP, but he never really lived here. And, and the, the reason uh, I can say that is that, well, his, his uh, father worked for the Milwaukee Railroad and his uh, wife was pregnant with Rigney at that time. And he didn't want to leave her at, at home because she was uh, pretty darn close to, to giving birth. And so he took her on that, that train ride from Green Bay on up to the UP and uh, along about Ontonagon, uh, his wife went into labor for, <laughs> for Rigney. And so he was born here in the UP, but he, he never really lived here. Uh, and he was a member of the 1919 Packers along with his brother, Dutch Dwyer. And uh, they both played uh, in the 1920 season as well. And uh, the, I guess the interesting and also unfortunately quite tragic story with regard to uh, Rigney Dwyer is that even though he was born on the railroad, 24 years later, he nearly died working on, on the, uh, the railroad. And I'm gonna let his uh, grand niece, uh, Jean Eckers, uh, continue that story. The second meeting that year between Green Bay and Stambo would mark the first Thanksgiving Day game for the Packers on November 25th. However, the day before the game, 
Packer player Rigney Dwyer was severely injured in an accident while working for the Milwaukee Railroad. Jean Eckers is the granddaughter of Dutch Dwyer, Rigney's brother and Packer teammate. Well, from what my dad tells me is that Rigney, well, both Rig and his brother Dutch worked for the Milwaukee Railroad. And uh, Rigney was um, working on the tracks. I think he was a switchman. And, you know, accidents happened all the time. A train came through. Um, he had to roll himself out of the way or he would have been cut right down the middle. So he rolled his body and that took his right arm and his right leg off. And my grandfather was there and ran to his side and basically, you know, I, as I understand it, did the tourniquets and probably saved his life at that point. As Dwyer fought for his life, the Packers battled the Stambo All-Stars and messages regarding the game were relayed to and from his hospital room. Like their first two meetings, Stambo played well, but the Packers won 14 to nothing. Fortunately, Rigney Dwyer would eventually prevail as well, and he recovered with the help of his brother Dutch. Your grandfather was not only there to help save his life, he's there to help raise the money, to help get Rigney the, the treatments that he needed to recover. Absolutely. The, you know, Dutch organized this, this fundraiser for Rig, because uh, you imagine the hospital bills that they had, and uh, the team and the town, the city of Green Bay, uh, really rallied around Rigney, uh, and they raised um, a considerable amount of money. Dutch and Rigney would both go on to live full lives beyond this tragic event and beyond football. My grandfather worked on the railroad, of course, he was a conductor on the railroad, but then he also went to law school and became a lawyer. And he was on the city council for Green Bay and he always helped the downtrodden. And he, if they couldn't pay, he'd say, give me some fish or, you know, I mean, my grandfather, the stories I hear about my grandfather is he was a very generous man with his um, skills as a lawyer. And then of course, Rigney, despite his injuries, he went on to serve for numerous years as our Brown County Register of Deeds. And I think I had mentioned that the year that my great uncle passed away, it was an election year and he had won by a landslide. Uh, the year that he died, he, he still had won, they still voted for him. The second meeting. The so Rigney, uh, again, it was an amazing story and Jean did a great job with, with that interview. And, and actually there's more to um, her story as, as well, but uh, we'll get into that when, when you watch the, the full documentary. But in addition to uh, Rigney Dwyer, uh, there were five other uh, Packers uh, from the UP uh, that were born here and, and lived for varying amounts of time before moving down to uh, to uh, Green Bay. So a total of six players were on that original 1919 team. I think there were 22 players total uh, that, that made up that, that very first team in Green Bay. And when the Packers started out, this was their, this was their home field, uh, Hagemeister Park in, in downtown. And uh, it wasn't much, <laughs> but uh, it, it was home to them for, for a number of years before they went to Bellevue Park. And then they went on to uh, uh, this stadium right here, this is uh, a city stadium that uh, they built and uh, dedicated in 1925. And another interesting first about city stadium is that uh, the very first game that they played there was against a team from the UP. And uh, I guess you'll have to watch the documentary to find out which, which, team, which team that was. But uh, this was a major upgrade for the Packers because now that in 1925, they'd be already been in the uh, NFL for for three years. So it was definitely time to, uh, to uh, get a, a better place to, to play their games. Uh, at the individual level, uh, just a number of people stand out. And again, I interviewed 16 different folks and, and I don't really recall how many different players and uh, the different combinations and teams and whatnot that I put into the documentary. But uh, this is Wally Neiman. 
Uh, he was uh, from Menominee, Michigan, and he wound up playing four years at the University of Michigan. And that wouldn't you know, be too uncommon, but uh, he played center uh, at 155 pounds. He was fairly slight, but uh, he was nonetheless very effective as, as a lineman uh, in college football. And of course, he goes on to play for the Packers and was one of the, again, one of the better linemen in the league, uh, even giving up sometimes 60 to 70 pounds to the people that he was trying to block. Um, but uh, even more over than, than that, he was, he was more than a football player. He was a very bright young guy and uh, he was an inventor. And so I did a patent search and I ran his name through the U.S. Patent Office and this popped up. This was, uh, um, you can see right here, Walter A. Neiman. And he uh, invented a fuel compressor that improved the fuel efficiency of the internal combustion engine and got a patent for that in, in 1960. So uh, really interesting side stories here to some of these players. Um, now we've already talked about the University of Michigan. I only think it's fair that we talk about uh, the Michigan Agricultural College or of course, uh, Michigan State University. Uh, this is Nino De Prado here, number 14. He was a fullback at uh, Michigan State and he was uh, from Dickinson County. And he was not just any old college player, he was the college player. Uh, and he was a dominant player at that point uh, in college football. He was a consensus All-American and uh, he set a record for scoring 130 points in just six games. Uh, and again, at that time, the teams weren't running up huge scores. So that was really quite an accomplishment. Actually against Michigan, he scored all three touchdowns. Uh, he was uh, quite unstoppable at, at, at that point. And uh, he went on to play for the Detroit Heralds and the Detroit Tigers in the early NFL. Uh, and then uh, just stepped away from football and spent the rest of his life in, in the National Guard. Uh, so again, a lot of these guys had served in World War One, and they had a strong sense of, of uh, service. And so we, we see that theme uh, kind of borne out in, in the documentary uh, several times. Uh, speaking of college football here, uh, we're looking at, this is of course, Notre Dame with Coach uh, Rockney and a fellow you might have heard of by the name of Lambeau. That's Curly as a young man in 1918. And this is of course, the legend of Lorium, George uh, Gipp. And uh, it's very likely that Gipp recruited um, Fred O.J. Larson and Hartley Hunk Anderson, everybody had nicknames. I guess you almost had to have a nickname in order to, to, to play at Notre Dame at that time. But uh, anyway, these players, uh, again, were likely recruited by Gip because I know for a fact that he recruited another player by the name of Peaches Nadolny uh, from Ironwood uh, as well. So uh, uh, interesting connections there, but it even goes beyond just Notre Dame here because uh, Fred Larson and Hartley Anderson wind up playing a game under assumed names for the Packers when they had one year of college eligibility still left. And even though that was commonly done by a lot of teams at that time, it still was a no-no according to the uh, American uh, Professional Football Association. So that was the group the Packers were affiliated with at that time and they got busted. Uh, the Packers were kicked out of the league uh, for, for having um, played Anderson um, and Larson in that game. So imagine if the Packers do not get reinstated uh, there's, there's no Lambeau Field, no Lombardi Trophy, no record uh, 13 NFL titles, and certainly I'm not doing a documentary of, about uh, being linked to legends because there wouldn't have been any. Uh, so it, it's really quite remarkable what, uh, what had to happen for the Packers to continue on. And as luck would have it, it was that year in the offseason that the American Professional Football Association became the National football league and so the Packers get reinstated I think for around three or four hundred dollars it wasn't much but it darn good investment for sure so that was again another one of these little side stories that, that just pops up as as you go into the uh, into the research on on this now the Packers did blow out a lot of the teams from the UP but this was one of them that they really had a tough time with this is uh the, the Stambo All-Stars, it's a mining community there tied into Caspian and the Iron River area there in Iron County. And Stambo had a fantastic football program going on down there. And uh, this group of young guys uh, played the Packers in 1919. Uh, Packers came north to play in, at Stambo actually. 
And up until that time, the Packers have been blowing everybody out. Their, their average margin of victory was like 60 plus points. I mean, they, they just couldn't find anyone really that was terribly competitive. But at the end of the first half against the Stamba Wall Stars, the final score or the, the score at halftime was zero to zero. And unfortunately for the Stamba Wall Stars, the Packers decided to unleash their passing game and, and beat them 17 to nothing. But it still was a very close competitive game. And uh, speaking of competitive teams, this was uh, this is the Ironwood team from 1922. This is a team picture before they were about to play Bessemer, which was another really good team from from the uh, upper Michigan area. And uh, looks like we've got. Uh, Bobby Marshall here uh, in, in the photo as well. He was uh, one of the first African-American players uh, to play in the NFL in that 20, 1922 season. He played for, for Ironwood. So in addition to the, you know, they had 16,000 people in Ironwood at that time, which made it the largest city in the UP uh, at, at that time. So they had you know, plenty of players to draw from, but they were, they were also going out and getting uh, some of these big name players from, uh, from either co the college ranks or uh, pro professionals like uh, Bobby Marshall. Um, and also I should point out that uh, Ironwood played the Packers uh, in 1924 and again played them tough. They lost 15 to nothing, but the Packers at that time now starting their third season in the NFL. So they were, Packers were a bona fide team at that point. And uh, they, the Ironwood team also played uh, Kelly, the Kelly Duluths from of course Duluth, Minnesota a number of times in, in their team history. And uh, the Duluth Kellys or Kelly Duluths uh, were uh, an NFL team for several years. And, and in 1924, they went five and one in the NFL. So this was a good football team over in Duluth. And uh, in the games against Ironwood, though, uh, they, they, of course, it was a non-NFL game, a non-league game, but Ironwood played them to a zero to zero tie three times in a row that season. So they were quite competitive with, with teams uh, from, from the NFL. So that gives you, an, it gives you an idea for the, the quality of the types of players uh, that, that uh, were playing in some of these uh, town team leagues at, at, at the time in the UP, uh, that they were in, indeed uh, quite, uh, quite competitive. And I've got one final video clip here I'd, I'd like to share. It looks like we've got a little bit more time and uh, we'll, we'll jump into that here because I, I know it might seem odd, but I'm, I'm going to play the, the last part of the documentary and then go into the credits because it will allow you to see all the, the different uh, uh, components that went into the creation of, of this documentary. And I did my best to try to make the credit roll visually interesting. So uh, hopefully you, you won't uh, be, be too bored by it. But anyway. The real loser on that day would be the entire UP because it became clear that the Packers were now truly in another league. From this point forward, the contests would be against bigger cities and bigger names, and the Packers would soon win three NFL championships in a row. But I'd like to think that the spirit of the miners, mill workers, and yes, those meat packers who played for the love of the game still lives on in the only town team to survive from its inception to the modern day NFL. So we can all take some pride in knowing that the early years of the Packers and other fledgling NFL teams and the legends who played for them will be forever linked to Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Uh, actually, I think I'm going to cut it off there because I realize we're, we're running a little tight on, on time. So I'm going to I'm going to jump out of that and uh, I'll turn it back over to uh, to Dan. That was great, Dwight. Thank you. You're going to have to end your sharing here. I don't know. Oh, OK. Yep. Yep. There we go. All right, All right. fantastic. Now oh, it's my turn to share. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, I just realized that these are 20 minute sessions, not half hour sessions. I suppose I figured I better do Well, that's all right. We're the last one. <laughs> We're the last one today. So uh, sure. uh, it's not showing my, oh, there it is. Okay. All right, can you see it? Yeah. All right, fantastic. 
Uh, just to remind people after I'm done, we'll take Q&A. So if you want to type any questions in the Q&A function, please do. So football is the stuff of legend in the UP. There is hardly a town or a high school in the region that doesn't have its glory days. However, for most of the 20th century, the state of Michigan did not have an officially sanctioned state championship for football. Some of the UP's greatest teams never had a chance to show the talent uh, to the rest of the state and possibly college recruiters and the great talent that existed up here. As Dwight Brady mentioned, the roots of football go very deep in the Upper Peninsula. As early as the 1890s, high schools throughout the UP were fielding competitive football teams. Following in the footsteps of college programs, schools saw these games as fun extracurricular activities for students, but also as ways to bring communities together. From these games came great community pride and longstanding rivalries, including this photograph here, which is of the uh, 1940-something uh, Menominee and Marinette, Wisconsin, which is the oldest interstate rivalry in football in the country, going back to 1894. Uh, and in the UP, as you can see, we've had some rivalries going back uh, almost as far. Nagani and Ishpeming have the longest standing one, though this year they did not play because of COVID, but 146 games starting in 1895 up to last year. Nagani and Marquette uh, used to play up until three years ago, uh, 142 games, and Escanaba and Menominee have 124 games that they've played since uh, 1897. So uh, it is a long history, probably more than any other uh, sport in the UP. Actually, though, there has only been official state high school football playoffs since 1975. There were sanctioned championship games in the first decade of the 20th century. In late 1899, the University of Michigan and Michigan High School Athletic Association Committee decided to hold a state championship game each Thanksgiving weekend. The second year of the championship, they invited Ishpeming High School to compete against Orchard Lake Michigan Military Academy. The Hematites won their first state championship by defeating Orchard Lake 12 to six. Ishpeming would go on to win the title the next two years as well, 1901 against Kalamazoo 27 to 21, and in 1902 against Benton Harbor, 35 to 12. A little quote about that from a book called We Played the Game by John Armstrong. The state championship game at that time was a matchup between the best team from the UP and the best team from the Lower Peninsula. Ishpeming won the game 35 to 12, but it was not without controversy. Gambling on high school sports was common at the turn of the century, and rumors circulated after the game that the referee had placed a $50 bet on Ishpeming to win the game. In 1903, Escanaba was selected to play in a championship game, but lost to Benton Harbor 22 to nothing. Escanaba had a season record of six wins and one loss to the Escanaba City team, as, uh, which existed, as um, Dwight mentioned, and one tie. The high school team played Mount Pleasant in the state championship and won 16 to five the following year. Uh, in 1905, Ishpeming would return as the state champion, defeating Grand Rapids Central by a score of 17 to five. And after the 1906 game, there was no longer one held on a yearly basis. Escanaba's high school team in 1907 was supposed to play Saginaw in the state championship, but the Saginaw team refused to play them either at home or in the UP. Uh, and therefore they won by forfeit. The next year, Escanaba was the UP champ again, but the game with Ann Arbor was never, never materialized. For the next 70 years, there was no actual official state football championship, though occasionally games were organized by the best teams in the state at the end of the season. In 1925, Ironwood High School put together one of the most powerful teams in UP history. Led by fullback John Cabosi, the Red Devils went undefeated through six games, during the regular season, outscoring their opponents 165 to nothing. Cabosi not only led the team in running, but also set a world record distance with a drop kick of 55 yards. The only blip on their season was a tie with Superior Wisconsin 0-0. Zero zero. At the end of the season, the state director of athletics decided for the first time in several years to invite a UP team to come down and play a championship game. It was Ironwood's first time playing in the lower in Lower Michigan, and its opponent was the much vaunted Redford High School. The Red Devils were not given much chance in the championship game held on Thanksgiving Day in Detroit. But in the end, another UP team proved its worth and defeated Redford by the score of 47 to nothing. Redford simply could not stop Ironwood's passing game and open style of play. 
John Cabosi would later go on to be a standout player for the Wisconsin Badgers and then the Portsmouth Spartans, the precursor to the Detroit Lions in the NFL. After 1925, there's no record of the best teams of the UP playing teams downstate other than in regular season games. This is a pity because the UP had such strong football programs during the next 50 years. One of those programs was the Sault Ste. Marie Blue Devils, who between 1929 and 1932 had a record of 22 wins, two losses, and four ties. In 1930, the team went 8 and 0, sharing the mythical UP title with Besmer, who were also undefeated. Another powerhouse team from that time was St. Joseph's Purple Warriors from Escanaba, who in 1931 and 1932 went undefeated with a record of 14 victories and four ties. A side note, the Bomir Center's benefactor, John Bomir, was a star player at St. Joe's, which earned him a football scholarship to Northern Michigan College in 1949. Because of the lack of a tournament, in 1949, the Upper Peninsula Sports Writers Association created the Barber Trophy, named for the former legendary coach of the Sault Ste. Marie Blue Devils. Floyd Barber and some of his players from his 1913 team raised the funds to create the trophy, and this is a picture of that team with Floyd Barber. It has been awarded every year since to honor the best football team in the UP as voted by the UP sports writers. Menominee has held the trophy more than any other school, having won 23 times. This year, Marquette took the honor of the Barber Trophy for the first time since 1975. Calumet received the trophy in 2019 for the first time in their history. Between 1949 and 1975, there were many legendary holders of the Barber Trophy. In his very first year of existence, there was a controversy over which team deserved it. When undefeated Stambo was given the trophy over Newberry, who had one tie against Ironwood, yet Newberry were voted the Class B state champs by the Detroit Free Press. Newberry's winning ways continued in the 1950 season, led by backs Joel Vilmuir and John McIntyre. The Indians dominated all their opponents, ending the season with a perfect 7-0 record. No team came within three touchdowns of Newberry in any of the games. The Indians outscored their opponents by an incredible 217 to 20 points and the end of the season ranked third in Class B. In 1950 season, they would go down as the greatest in Newberry history, a perfect 8-0, extending their winning streak to 21 games, the longest in UP sports history at the time, scoring 276 points to their opponent's 16. Um, at their closest game was against Marquette. They won 28-2. Their running back, Tom Taylor, and center were named all UP team, the all-UP team, and they received the coveted Barber Trophy in addition to being ranked number one in Class B by the Detroit Times. Now, here is something I discovered doing this research. At one time, there was six-man football in the UP. And I only found this out when I found an article, November 1953 article, about the Berglund Vikings football team that had just finished its third straight undefeated season. Between 1951 and 53, the team went 18-0, defeating other six-man programs at Ewan, St. Ambrose, and Ironwood, and Mercer, Wisconsin. There were several UP teams that won both the Barber Trophy and Mythical State Championships before the official state tournament began in 1975. The 1953 Ironwood, 1956 Sault Ste. Marie, and 1959 Manistique teams were all named uh, the Class B state champs by the Detroit Free Press. Oh, I have to go back here. Um, the uh, Manistique was led by Ron Rubrick, known as the Manistique Missile. Ron set numerous UP high school records and was voted All-Star Senior Team, the All-UP Team, and UP Back of the Year, and named to the All-State Football Dream Team, and the nice National High School All-American Team. His football jersey 33 was permanently retired in 1960 and hangs in the main corridor of the Manistique High School. Ron, re Ron received or played for the Michigan State University. There in his junior year, he set a single game rushing record that stood for many years. In 1960, Wakefield won its first and only Barber Trophy and were named the number one class C D team by the UPI coaches poll in the state of Michigan. And uh, Detour was named in 1968 class D state champs um, by the free press, but Escanaba won the Barber Trophy that year. One of the most dominant teams of the pre-playoff era was a 1973 Escanaba squad, which went 9-0, outscoring their opponents 323-65. to They won the Barber Trophy and were ranked eighth in the state Class A poll. 
The team was led by Wayne Schwalbach, who was named the Class A All-State team, only the second player to receive that honor after Ron Rubick. He was selected a UP Class AB back of the year in both his junior and senior years and set many school records, including 32 touchdowns in his career. He went on to a stellar career at Central Michigan and then signed with the Steelers as a free agent in the NFL. Everything changed in 1975 when the Michigan High School Athletic Association held the very first Michigan State Championship Tournament. Unlike today, the tournament was split into only four classes, A, B, C, and D, and there were only four teams in each class were invited to compete. In the very first year, the UP made a very powerful statement winning both the Class C and D championships. So why did it take so long for Michigan to adopt the playoff system for football, and why did they change their mind in 75? For 70 years, there had been no official state final game, and there had been longstanding discussions and arguments for and against having a tournament. Unlike basketball, which has had a statewide tournament since 1925, football can only be played once a week and on a weekend day, especially before lights. This would make it difficult to schedule a full-fledged tournament before basketball season would start in Thanksgiving. So for a long time, high school administrators were not in favor of a longer season, which would increase costs and impact students' education. Secondly, how does one determine who gets into playoffs? The MHSAA had been watching for several years computerized point systems that other states had used to determine which teams qualified for the playoffs. And in 1974, tested that system successfully. However, there were many coaches in schools that were still very concerned because they believed, and rightly so, that the new system would break up some of the traditional rivalries and conferences. This did in fact happen in some cases because teams gained more points by playing larger schools rather than longstanding rivals who just happened to be in a lower class. Lastly, there had long been a feeling in amateur football that playoffs didn't accurately determine who the best team was, but rather a team should be evaluated on its entire season, just as college football did until it instituted a limited playoff in 1998. The MHSAA was uh, satisfied with the test of computerized system in 1974 and 1975 announced the first tournament would take place in, uh, at the conclusion of the regular season. In the very first year, the final results of the computerized rankings were controversial and many great teams were left out, as we'll see later. But the results of the tournament created an enormous amount of ex excitement and public support for an expanded format. In Class C, the Ishpeming Hematites found themselves in a tough spot. Not only were they playing their first state football title in 70 years, but they were playing the dominant Hudson Tigers. Hudson entered a game with a national winning streak of 72 consecutive games. During an eight-year period, they had not allowed more than 21 points in a game. Anticipation for the game was great, but the odds were heavily in Hudson's favor. Still, the Tigers had never played a team from the UB before, and they met their match. Led by a backfield duo of Mark Marana and Mike D'Angelo at running back, Hudson would not, could not stop Ishpeming's powerful option-driven offense. The Hematites scored 24 points in the first quarter on their way to a 38 and 22 victory. D'Angelo led the way with 150 yards rushing and two touchdowns. It was a stunning victory celebrated not only by fans from Ishpeming, but across the UP. And as Ishpeming coach Mike Molesky said to the press after the game, I've been trying to tell you guys, we played pretty good football in the Upper Peninsula. On the very same day in 1975, that Ishpeming defeated Hudson for the Class C title, Crystal Falls Forest Park Trojans won the most lopsided state final in Michigan history in Class D in Kalamazoo. After pounding six, posing 67 to nothing in the state semifinal, uh, Crystal Falls Forest Park soundly defeated Flint Holy Rosary in the final 50 to nothing. The team was led by four rushing touchdowns by Bill Santilli, a state final record that stood for 35 years. The Trojans would return the next year to beat Holy Rosary by a score of 14 to six but a dynasty had been created that represents one of the UP's most dominant and successful football programs. Now, since 1975, Upper Peninsula teams have won 27 state championships and have played in 55 state final games. The team with the most state championship victories is Ishpeming with five and Crystal Falls Forest Park has the most state final appearances with 14. Um, maybe the UP's greatest moment in high school football was when the Eskimos of Escanaba did the most impossible thing, winning the Class A state championship in 1981. Led by offensive and defensive standout Tony Altabelli, the Eskimos beat teams from high schools over twice their size to win the tournament. 
In the final game, they defeated Fraser 16 to six. This is still the only UP sports team in any sport to win a class A state championship. But in 1975, Turnip finally gave teams in the UP a chance to show their abilities downstate. For the first two years, only four teams in each class were selected to play. In 77, it was expanded to eight teams, but this still meant that several great teams never had the opportunity to play in the state playoffs, several of which were undefeated in the regular season. The same year that the state football championship began, the Market Redmen went undefeated and were awarded the Barber Trophy. However, they were a class A team and they were not invited to play in the tournament. The reason had to do with the scoring system, which gave points for victories based on the size of the schools you defeated. Marquette played mostly class B and C teams. Escanaba was the only other class A team. And so they didn't get enough points to qualify. This happened to many UP teams and probably lower peninsula teams as well over the next decade. In the same year, Norway High School also went undefeated and were tied with Ishpeming for playoff points. However, Ishpeming won the region due to their opponents having a greater percentage of wins. Ishpeming proved themselves worthy winning the aforementioned state final against Hudson. The next season, Norway went undefeated again, outscoring their opponents 342 to 56. However, they were, even though they were ranked number one, the number one team in Class C with the Detroit Free Press, they still did not make the playoffs, losing out to Onaway by 1.3 points. Hmm. However, in 1979 and 1980, they dropped on the Class D and won consecutive state championships. The Hancock Bulldogs were also undefeated two years in a row in 1983 and 1984, but did not make the playoffs. And the Stevenson Eagles went undefeated in 1982, but were not selected. Maybe the worst snub ever was when 1981 Varaga Vikings went undefeated, outscoring their opponents 379 to 42. Instead, Crystal Falls Forest Park was selected for the Class D playoff, even though they had one loss to Besmer, a team Varaga had beaten. The reason why Crystal Falls was selected was because they had more victories over Class C opponents than Barriga. It was due to the unfair snubbing of teams like these that in 1985, the MH, MHSAA expanded the playoffs to 16 teams in each class. And then in 1990, further expanded the tournament to eight classes with 16 teams each. In 1998, the MHSAA created the current system, which selects 256 teams across the state with five or more victories during the regular season and then divides them into eight divisions by school size. In addition, there are several dozen eight man football programs that are split into two divisions. This system is much more fair since in the past, there were many small class A teams with 1000 students who were playing against schools two or three times their size in the playoffs. And for this reason, class B teams like Menominee and Kingsford usually play in division five or six. Yet the UP teams have been increasingly less competitive on the state level in recent years. The last team to appear in a state final game other than an eight man football team, or eight man football, which is dominated by UP teams was Ishpeming, which won the division seven title in 2015. It concluded an amazing four year run by the Hematites who had won three out of four state final games between 2012 and 2015. Other than Ishpeming program, the nominee last won a state championship in Division Five in 2007. So the UP is due to regain the prominence it once had in the game. However, regardless of the opportunities for teams to play in the postseason, participation in football has definitely waned in the last decade or two. There are many reasons for this decline, some valid and others not. But there's no doubt that the declining school populations have played a big part in uh, in, across the UP. Since the 1980s, nine schools have either dropped football or have created co-op programs between them. 13 schools went from class D 11 man teams to eight man programs. Maybe the most symbolic change was when the perennial class D powerhouse Crystal Falls Forest Park switched to eight man football in 2016. However, the advent of eight man football adopted by the MHSAA in 2011 probably has saved football programs that would have been dropped by smaller schools. Still, the UP has left a true mark on the football landscape in the state of Michigan and beyond. Far more UP football players have gone on to play in Division I college programs and in, any, and in professional leagues and any other sport. Many of those players and others have gone on to become legendary football coaches on the high school, college, and pro level. I wish I had time to list all these individuals, but many of them have been inducted into the UP Sports Hall of Fame 
So you should go to their website to learn more. And this is one team that definitely was not a legendary team, but I put it up there because I'm on it along with my brother, Paul. This is the 1982 Wakefield Cardinals. We had a whopping one and seven record. We beat White Pine. Uh, and uh, I'm in the second row, third from the right. Paul's in the front row, third from the left. Next to Brad Grable, who played here at Northern Michigan University as a defensive back. So I just wanted to pull that up for all my Wakefield brothers uh, and, and friends out there who I thought would, would get a kick out of that. Um, and I want to thank Jim Dwyer, Russ Mackey, Ron Pesch, uh, the Mice Michigan High School Athletic Association, UP Football, Newspapers.com, the Sports Radio Association, and the Hall of Fame for all their help in me collecting all this, this data. And there's a lot there. And with that, we've got about 15 minutes for questions and discussion. And it looks like we've got a question here. Uh, uh, someone says, Jack is very knowledgeable. Uh, the Shepich name is legendary in football in Stambo. Did you come across the, uh, the Shepich name, Dwight? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, uh, yeah, the Shepik name is, is pretty familiar down in that part of the, the UP uh, because Frank Shepik uh, was an outstanding player uh, for Stambo High School back in the 1920s and, and then uh, went on to play at Wisconsin. And when he came back, then he continued on with uh, the semi-pro league. Now that uh, we talked a little bit about the Stambo team, the Stambo All-Stars, and he played for the All-Stars, I think in the 30s. And, and he continued on as a player coach uh, I think until about the 1950s, mid 50s, before they finally shut down the, the semi-pro leagues, because once uh, foot, uh, once uh, television uh, and NFL football kind of took over Sunday afternoons, it was really hard for the town teams to, to really make a go of it. But he, he kept it going for three decades. So pretty impressive. Well, I, I, I before I had a talk, I, I, I gave my talk, I had a question for you and now I lost it. Um, <laughs> But we had talked about this uh, uh, some time ago that uh, the great physicist Glenn Seaborg went to that game uh, when the Packers played oh, the 1919 game. game. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. Um, he was a boy at the. He was only like nine years old, and his dad took him to the game, and uh, it made quite an impression on him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that I think uh, uh, Frank Shepik, uh, uh, his. Uh, Son uh, Jack mentioned that, he, that that Frank was there at that uh, Green Bay Packers Stambo game when he was about the same age, around nine or ten, and again it had a lasting impact on him, and that's why he I think probably stayed with the, the semi pro league as long as he did there in, in Stambo. Well, I, another thing oh, yeah, I finally remember what it was. Um, you showed the picture of uh, Notre Dame uh, with yes. Gip, and I had read it was a book somebody had written about Gip. A biography of him that it was actually one of those other guys who brought Gip to Notre Dame, and the way it was was he this it was a guy from Calumet, I think he was a lineman, and Gip asked him, "Are there any other good players up there?" And he said, "Oh yeah," he says, "There's this amazing athlete up there named George Gip. He's incredible. You got to bring him down." Well, the thing is, is that Gip by that time was a semi-pro baseball player. Um, playing around here in a town, but as a semi-pro. And apparently, though, he went to high school like his freshman year and was a huge athletic standout. He never graduated from high school right. and went to Notre Dame. So the rules then were so much different that, one, you didn't, didn't even have to have a degree. To <laughs> and you could have already been paid to be an athlete and you could yeah. still be a college athlete. <laughs> Um, and he was a notorious gambler when he was at Notre Dame, I guess, too. Um, so he had, a, he had another side to him, but man, what an amazing athlete. He made quite the impression. A 62 yard drop kick in his freshman year. Can you believe that? That's incredible. That's <laughs> he had a unbelievable. Something in the water up there, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what they say in Crystal Falls, why they always had such good football teams, something in the water. Um, and, uh, but it is amazing how how you know programs have those those you know uh, success. It, it success breeds success. You know. And yeah. You and one thing when I started looking at the the uh, the communities that had these town teams, you know, the semi pro leagues, and uh, that had you know some success against the Packers, 
uh, you look at Iron County, right? Uh, and, and, and Stambo, of course, in the neighboring um, city there, of course, is, is Crystal Falls. And then Menominee, that those roots continued right on through to, you know, uh, the modern time of uh, those uh, great teams they had there in Menominee. And then out in, uh, uh, of course, in Ishpeming too. There's, so there's, there's some links there between some of the semi-pro leagues. And a lot of it was just because they, they, they were, uh, you know, centers of a population because of the mining industry and whatnot. But some of it too was just that they, they had built that tradition and it continued and it became generational. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, and it, you know what, if you go to certain towns, you see the same names on yep. teams today, uh, whether it's the Marquette high or Nagani or Ishpeming, um, the same families are still playing football and have carried it on. Your son played at Marquette high. Correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and you mentioned Mike Delangelo there on the 1975 uh, Ishpeming team. I had the pleasure of uh, playing against Mike, my, my, my junior year, first game as a varsity player. And I, I have to tackle Mike Delangelo, I think about 12 times in the first half. And he, <laughs> he, he was quick, I'll tell you what. Uh, but then he, he went the other direction in the second half and ran off, I think, two, two long scores and beat us 14 to six. <laughs> it, was a, it was a good game, but it, it was a treat just, just to play against him. He was, he was outstanding. Yeah, I, I think about that too. I, I played against some really amazing players, some of whom were went on to the NFL, uh, definitely played division one college football. Mm. And, and I'd always dreamed of playing college football, but it was playing against guys like that, that I realized, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a future in college football, <laughs> at least at Northern, maybe uh, somewhere else, but I wanted to come to Northern. So I knew uh, my football career was over. Um, but yeah, some amazing, amazing players that I've seen and uh, played against. Um, it, it, but it, I don't know, as a player, I, I've written about this. I, I wrote another article. This I wrote totally different from that, but I've got a complicated feeling with football as a former player. Um, on one hand, I loved it. On the other hand, there's parts of it that I now kind of regret. Um, do you have any similar feelings about your days playing? I just a little stiffness in the neck. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it clicks a, a few times once in a while, and I, I, I probably played with a concussion or two that I shouldn't have, but that's the way that's what you did back then, I guess. So, um, but I was wondering if there's any other other questions here about uh, about what you presented and and uh, what uh, what I talked about here with Link to Legends. Happy no, we don't. Up. We don't have any other questions here. Um, Okay. So we, we're kind of at the end of the day. I think everyone's a little worn out. Yeah. Um, we will be uh, recording, or this is being recorded, and we will put it up on our website so people can uh, share it and watch it later or uh, send it to all their friends. And uh, so I hope it'll get a life after this. And then we can get emails from people really angry we didn't mention so and so. And. <laughs> <laughs> You covered it very, very well. I'll tell you what. Oh, uh, I, I, there's so many teams, there's so many players and coaches that I would like to go into. That maybe there's a part two that's really about the legends, uh, the the players and coaches uh, who mm -hmm. I didn't get to cover enough, uh, and because there really is some great history there. And um, I think you know, I think that's it. Football in the UP has, you know, basketball has got a long history, and baseball even, and hockey, of course. But football and the UP just seem to go together. There's something very uh, youper about the game, and and uh, and and it's just a you know it's a deep history. That was life changing for me when I was 15 years old. Uh, that's that's when they had the first playoff season in '75, and Ishpeming goes down and, and wins it. Forest Park wins it, and then that same year, NMU wins you know the Division Two national title. It was it was incredible. It was like wow. You, People from the UP, these kids, they, they, they can accomplish some really great things. So that was inspiring for sure. Well, Dan, Dan Hinch has, did ask, of, um, you know, when, when did the chant UP power come into play? Um, because now, you know, when UP teams go down state to play in tournaments, uh, that is a very common chant. And I remember hearing it in high school when I went down state for tournaments. Um, and I don't know if it started in 75. I know that the term was being used then in, mm -hmm. in 75. I don't know if it was predated by that uh, with basketball tournaments or not. Do you have any idea about that, Dwight? 
No, the 75 sounds like it would be the logical time frame when that would really would have taken root uh, because of the, that was the first time that, again, the UP teams could play uh, head to head and uh, yeah, it would, would certainly make sense. Yeah, I before that, I mean, but yeah, the basketball tournaments, I mean, that's my maybe my next research project is on great basketball teams, high school basketball teams. There were a lot of legendary Uper teams that went down and, and did very, very well. Um, downstate in basketball and uh, um, so I don't but I don't know if it predates 1975 it's uh, I you know newspapers.com might be able to help us with that one I'll have, to, <laughs> I'll have to dive in and see if I can find that it find it anywhere uh, that phrase but uh, it's certainly important now uh, we'll see tonight uh, we got some playoff games and tomorrow and so hopefully some UP teams will head downstate um, in football uh, this year. So, and I don't see any other questions. So I think we can wrap this up. Okay. Dwight, it's been great. I love your project. It's well, thank you. Uh, and, yours. <laughs> and uh, I just, uh, you know, glad we're keeping this.